X Prize is actually it's solved for X is that we know there are huge problems that we don't have solutions for. And so one way of going about finding solutions, right? A traditional academic. Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel in each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light, and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gil Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Des How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Insight Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Jamie Justice, who will discuss XPRIZE HealthSpan. Dr. Justice is the Executive Vice President of the Health Domain at XPRIZE Foundation, an adjunct professor in internal medicine on gerontology and geriatric medicine, and Stick Center on Aging and Alzheimer's Present Prevention at Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Dr. Justice is dedicated to geroscience research that advances the hypothesis that by targeting the basic biology of aging, the incident of multiple age-related disease science hypothesis in humans. In her role as EVP of Health Domain, she leads international networks to drive innovative solutions to improve human health and aging that is affordable and accessible to all. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, uh, uh, Jamie, it is a, a, a pleasure having you. And uh, when I heard about the X Prize, for longevity, I, I was jumping in my uh, office because it's uh, it's like literally a dream that came true that uh, uh, finally the uh, some attention is coming for aging research and longevity. We'd like to uh, start from the beginning, and uh, we usually ask our guests uh, what uh, led them to become a scientist. So we'd love to hear your story. <laughs> I um. I actually, the first time I went to college, I thought I was going to be an artist. I went on an art scholarship and was at least a talented visual artist at one point. And I went to college and had sort of a horrible rude awakening where I realized that I was just a mediocre artist. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a little too young to take the criticism and also learned that I was just a bit too analytical. Is that, you know, I really liked, you know, sort of the process and thinking and doing and ended up sort of backing my way into science when going back to school and thinking, you know, I'll go through my mother, mother was a physical therapist, really deeply involved in prevention and health and wellness and had grown up with that. And so we you know it's going back whether it's either going to go to med school or maybe be a physical therapist or wanted to do something in that realm. And it was actually when I was back in school and realized that I just, I really loved science is that there was some just about sort of the practice and the thought of it, but it, it wasn't until I went into a lab actually more by accident than intention that I really figured it out. And I was at one point was a former competitive snowboard racer in my through my teens and early 20s until I had a really major break of my right arm, both radius on the mid shaft break with really significant nerve damage. It was repaired, which was great. But about four years later, I, I started having really incredible pain and like a reflex disorder where I couldn't use my right hand. What had happened is one of the plates on my forearm had a screw that was a little bit too long. And it was great when I had a traumatic break because they needed the long screw to go have the bone capsule. But over time, that bone capsule began to wear down. Mm -hmm. So the end of that screw was then protruding into the into the space and so anytime i would pronate or supinate my hand the end of that deep interosseal branch of the radial nerve was snapping back and forth over the end of the screw Yikes. but because of all the metal and all the problems in my you know there it's like they couldn't do the imaging a lot of the tests were really messed up and we couldn't figure out what it was until um you know and i was really at my end so i had about nine to ten months of just not being able to use the right hand major nerve damage huge pain really learned firsthand you know it was firsthand, not not intended, but, you know, just, you know, what happens when the body is in dysfunction? 
and how all consuming that is. But, you know, through that process, I was taking a course in the neural control of human movement with Dr. Roger Inoka, and it was hitting very close to home when I had no neural control of my right hand. <laughs> and I was essentially a, a major pain in his ass for uh, the entire semester of, you know, saying, okay, this is great in the lamprey, this is great in the worm. What does it mean for humans? What does it mean for function? How do we bring this home? And became really involved. And so he invited me into the lab while I was getting experimental surgery to see what I could do for the arm. And that was it. I went in thinking I was just was going to be a good semester while I couldn't work and do other things and was waiting for the next thing. But I went into the lab and I never left. Mm -hmm. Is that it's, I realized that it was the exact place I needed to be. It was the creative space. We worked in teams. We asked hard questions. You know, the more complex, the better. And just always kind of keeping down to this, like, what does it mean? How do you apply it? What does it mean? How do you apply it? And just knowing that you're never actually going to have some of the answers, but we keep pursuing. Um, and so that was it. So that's how I found science. But then how did I find aging? That that that's your, that's will be the next question. But I just, <laughs> yeah. I, I, just want to, I, I just want to say that first one that uh, started as a competitive uh, skier, uh, <laughs> an artist that is competitive skier and become a, a scientist. So that's a, a very interesting story. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say it's hard to do really fine line work as an artist without a right hand. <laughs> so... <laughs> Unless you are a lefty. Unless you're a lefty. I did. I did spend some time actually learning how to draw paint and write with my left. Yeah. Um, wow. I don't default to it. It was incredibly hard. It made me embrace pastels and sort of really fat brushstroke work. <laughs> That's nice when the universe aligns. Yeah. <laughs> Doing bad things to show you what you need. Right. <laughs> How did you end up pivoting from that lab into where your focus is now on aging, health yeah. and longevity research? So in that lab, I got, I was really interested. I was also an endurance athlete. So in addition to snowboarding, when I left that is that I, I went on to have many competitive years as a endurance runner. And so doing, you know, 50 kilometer, 50 mile trail racing. And I was in Boulder, Colorado, where that was sort of the thing. It was very normal. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, that was great. And so I had been really interested in fatigue and fatigability and sort of what that, those components are, like what drives it, what are the mechanisms, what feeds into it. And so that was, you know, sort of my early master's work was looking at that and doing a lot of it, thinking of really about the problems of younger adults and performance and maximum performance and, and realize that, Young adults, especially on an undergraduate campus, they don't come in for research studies. If they do come in, they're often drunk still from the <laughs> night before. <laughs> the questions for maximizing human performance and, and endurance and fatigue, like they were interesting. But, you know, I, I was asked, like it was somebody else's sort of side question where they're like, well, you know, I think Roger was like, well, th you know, think about aging is that there's a mix with aging and fatigability, endurance improves. And I had been working also at that point, had done some work with them there, again, that endurance and sport community with endurance athletes and notice that promote, you know, masters athletes, my God, they're incredible. You know, they could just keep going. <laughs> and so I started asking questions about aging and the first bits of it were really practical is that, you know, suddenly like persons who were retired, they came these and they called ahead of time and they weren't late and they weren't drunk and they were pleasant <laughs> to be around. And they talked, you know, had really interesting, fascinating questions and had really deep, meaningful conversation. What was important for them in maintaining health and function? And it wasn't just about keeping a good marathon time, but it was really, you know, I want to stay functional. I want to stay healthy. I want to stay active. And it was the first time I'd really started asking questions and realized there was much more than this sort of endurance paradox, but, you know, it was much deeper and much more meaningful. And then also doing reverse translation work of, you know, what are we seeing in humans? And then how can we model it in animals? And realized at the same time that not only were older adults much more pleasant to work with, so were older animals. They don't bite as often. They don't. <laughs> and so I mean, there's all the practical things that when you're in your 20s doing, you know, graduate level work, these are, they're the minor things, but they were the things that made me stand in love with it. But I think what really hooked me is I remember it really distinctly is we had a point counterpoint discussion where we had, this was great, is we had two competing lectures. One lecture was by Leonard Hayflick, 
So Len, he was, you know, gosh, I mean, he really is the reason biogerontology exists in many ways. You know, he discovered, um, uh, you know, replicative senescence. And despite that, you know, he was a very strong advocate for sort of the, the second law of dynamics of aging is that aging is this stochastic process. You have just by happenstance, the body starts falling apart, you have degradation and leads on and on. And it was a very stochastic process. And then on, the, so he came and lectured. And then his counterpoint was somebody at the University of Colorado Boulder, who I didn't work with directly, but indirectly for quite a while, and he became a dear friend, was Tom Johnson. And Tom Johnson had original work that was looking actually at particular genes, aging, or as some call them, Geronto genes, is that there are genes that can be manipulated or natural gene variants that can actually extend lifespan. And so this points away from it being some kind of truly stochastic process. And I watched the two, and it was the first time that I just started working at aging. I was working with older adults. I was thinking about mice. I was thinking about these sort of molecular and cellular processes that might be driving not a disease per se, but functional decline. And it was the first time I'd had it put this way, where it's like, you know, I needed to go home and have a reboot. I get just like, just to sit down and think about what actually causes aging, how and why does it happen? And when we're thinking about interventions, can you actually do something? If it's purely stochastic, maybe not, but if there's something there, if there's a biology to it that can be manipulated, maybe, maybe there is. And so, and maybe the truth is somewhere in between. Certainly we're a little more complex than a C. elegans, but that there were pathways there that are really highly conserved. And there's variability in aging from somebody who ages incredibly well, these super centenarians. Others who live just, you know, orders of magnitude shorter, just within a single species. And so uh, it, was, it was the combination of those two things, being in sort of the right place at the right time, being just open enough to really hear it, and then having also a groundswell where this was in my early formative work. And that I got to be one of the first of a new generation of geroscience is that all this activity was happening when a new field was emerging, that this was not only possible, not only just some crazy idea, but this was a field of study. And it was one that was right edge of becoming something great. Yeah. I'm, um, and so it's wonderful yeah. timing, serendipity. Yeah, I remember that timing uh, from my uh, uh, point of view. I remember when they uh, cloned the gene or a wellness syndrome, and that's a, yeah. a premature aging syndrome. And they then said, oh, finally, there is <laughs> evidence that a, a premature aging syndrome have a gene that uh, causes it to uh, the, uh, the human to live uh, uh, shorter. And uh, yeah, I can work on aging. So that was my uh, moment. So Very similar. Yeah, you had exactly the same. It's exactly, yeah. it's a beautiful yeah. thing. When you sit down, you're like, oh, how? <laughs> yeah. How, why, and what can we do? It's exciting. Yeah. So, so uh, Jane, before we get into the X Prize, we'd like to know uh, a bit more information about uh, what have you researched in your lab before you est started working or initiated the X Prize for longevity? Yeah, so I have been, again, really fortunate. And, and my work, are, it's all completely very much aligned with what I'm doing now with XPRIZE, is, again, leaving a postdoc where we, we were looking at interventions that could target some of these basic biologic hallmarks. And, you know, we're again, doing tandem testing. Often I was in the clinical research space in the morning and in the vivarium testing animals in the afternoon, often with the same compound. We started with nutraceuticals and supplements, I also did lifestyle interventions from Western diet and exercise, either alone or in combination. And this was that was formative for my training. Around that time, there was a geroscience network was just being formed. This was 2013, 2014, new geroscience papers were just coming out. Geroscience had been coined before, but it was just becoming a field. Um, and I was very fortunate because I was working on this very early translation. How do you test and how do you match outcomes? And, you know, and the, the driving question from that point on has been, if you did have a therapeutic of any kind or an intervention of any kind, and it could affect the biology of aging or delay aging, like how would you know? And so that's been the driving question. So again, this geroscience hypothesis that there is a biology of aging, it can be targeted, 
and it can be targeted in a way that affects lifespan and health span, right? You can test that. We can do that. But how do you ultimately know that aging is and that it's been affected? And so this has been really, this has been the driving framework. And so it's just, how do we test it? How do you set it up? How do you push? How do you understand what we've done? And so this, you know, comes down to first, right? You have to understand, fully understand the problem, which means what is its biology and all its complexity? How do you define it? And how do you measure it in a way that's feasible? And so starting this work, the Science Network came out and was asking those exact questions. And so I got involved on a faculty exchange program. And so this was led by Steve Ostad, Nir Barsalai, and Jim Kirkland. And through that network and a few other networks and professional organizations, I met my then mentor after that, Steve Kruchevsky at Wake Forest. And this led us through that translational geroscience network to some really incredible work came out of that. One is out of some of our retreats is that we started setting up, you know, frameworks where what do you test in mice that's meaningful to humans and vice versa. And then two was we were there and started talking about you know, what we really need is an aging outcome and one that could be recognized by the FDA. And so out of those retreats came the TAME trial. So the TAME trial is targeting aging with metformin. It was envisioned as the first phase three clinical trial to create a regulatory pathway for aging that would be possibly recognized by the FDA. And there, the targetic that was identified was metformin because at the time it seemed like it could be effective and it was already being tested in humans, not tested, but, you know, prescribed one of the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drugs. And so it was the natural shoe. And we assumed that that would actually accelerate the process. That was not a good choice. <laughs> it has actually made it a lot longer and slower and harder to actually drive into a phase three trial. We thought that would be the accelerating pathway. It's safe. It's effective. We can give it. It's everywhere. It's a penny a pill. It's generic. You know, it's it hits so many buckets. And so it really allowed us to focus on the outcome and driving with the FDA. So that was some of my early work is about eight to 10 years for serving as the junior faculty underling that took on all the grunt labor and work that the big guys didn't have time to do for anything from organizing references, writing protocols, grant grants, and many other things to then turning that into working on the executive committee for the TAME trial, cool. and leading the biomarker and biomarker and biobanking component was my domain within the ex executive committee. And, and uh, Jamie, we interviewed yeah. Nir Barzilai a couple of oh, ago. Good. It's not out yet, but when your uh, episode will be out, uh, and, and Nir should be out, I think, the, uh, in a couple of days. Um, so right. it's it's great that uh, you connected between uh, the amazing work that Nir is doing to the amazing work that you are doing. It's uh, It's great to hear. Nir is one of my dearest, dearest friends, and I will never let him go. He's on my advisory board. <laughs> <laughs> I keep him on everything. He really is. He's one of the dearest, kindest people. And he's a fabulous scientist and an innovator that just sort of draws people behind him. It's like he's the boat and we're all in the wake. When Nir decides we're doing something, he says, okay, guys, and here we go. And everyone, we just sort of look around in the room we're like, Okay, we're going. <laughs> and he, he and, just had that. And you always have a good joke. So <laughs> he always has a good joke. So yeah, so we were developing Tame. And so there's this huge initiative and it's going to take forever to do it. But there's all of these small trials and work that still needs to be done. So at the same time, while we're driving the Tame trial, the other work that I got to do is that we started actually working with Jim Kirkland on, okay, smaller, earlier stage trial. And this was very much back to my training roots is on the early side of this is how do you go from animal to human? There's this huge divide where things will be tested in animals. Yes, you can test it. Yes, you get these lifespan effects, but then what, you know, and there's, there's a huge divide, even when you have a known regulatory pathway, there's a gigantic divide of taking something from an animal model into a human. And so in moving to Wake Forest, one of the reasons I went there is I thought what we needed were more intermediate animal models. And so I started also working in non-human primates is that we started thinking if we take the senolytics and maybe do testing in a non-human primate. It turned out because we were looking at repurposed drugs to satinib and quercetin, it was faster to actually just find the right clinical condition, faster and cheaper just to go straight to humans. And so that was the next work that we did. And so I was still doing some work in the monkeys, which is 
there's a whole other podcast. I'm not going there. It was great. <laughs> I love monkeys. They're fantastic. And I really respect people who work with them. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and they, they just, just to add to that, uh, since that the caloric <laughs> restriction study showed that uh, they spent, uh, I don't know, 20, 25 years with monkeys, and they've done it in two different centers, the NIH and Wisconsin. And one of them showed that is extending lifespan, the other one uh, is not sure. And the, there were a lot of issues with the concentration of the fat there. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's not clear and also not clean. And also you are not sure that the translation will work. So I'm 100% with you. Whatever works with human, for sure, will work with human. Whatever works with a uh, man, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And the the trial that we were working on when I first got there was led by Carol Shively and the monkeys. And it's a very cool study, but it was looking at Mediterranean versus Western diet. And oh my gosh, feeding studies in monkeys. I mean, I really, I just have to say that people that run lifespan studies and non-human primates, they are near sainthood. Like <laughs> it is <laughs> such a challenge. I yeah, such a I admire them greatly, but I decided to focus on humans. <laughs> and so and so we did some of the first work. We bypassed the monkeys and we started doing again what we thought was going to be this fast track first trial humans. And we partnered it in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So I started looking again with this nation. Let's do it in humans. Let's go for this disease. Because again, we have to look at the risk benefit fit ratio. Is it IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? This is a horrible disease that I've having met patients um, that were in these trials and with us is that, you know, they would almost rather have a lung cancer diagnosis because the options for treatment are better. Is that it's ultimately mm -hmm. fatal, typically in four years. And it is an awful, awful life altering disease. Um, so again, if anybody who does listen to this either has or has a loved one with IPF, my heart goes out to you. Absolutely. And so, you know, and there we needed any kind of a therapeutic or treatment that might benefit. But IPF is also one of those that its underlying features really match the biology of aging. Is it's idiopathic in nature. It's only exclusively found in persons who are older. And the lung that, uh, that um, alveolar epithelium is that it has all of those classic hallmarks that look a lot like aging. And so, and one of those hallmarks, of course, is senescence. And so we targeted it as a senescence associated disease that had very few options and really needed therapeutics developed there. And so we went into it there to balance that risk benefit. We could go into trials pretty quickly and also, you know, really try to make a difference in the lives of persons who have IPF while still you making informative decisions that could be helpful for clinical trials in aging, sort of testing this geroscience hypothesis. And so that's where we started. So that was all my foundational work was starting again, how do you test therapeutics from the small scale to the large scale, from mouse to monkeys to people? I decided on people. <laughs> and really, again, the endpoints there is looking at function rather than one disease, many diseases. Or, you know, again, my particular focus has always been on function, independence, physical frailty, and sort of more of this syndromic kind of um, trying of effect. And so it's been a really fun career of being completely therapeutic agnostic, still doing dietary intervention, still looking at exercise, still thinking about repurposed drugs, definitely have an eye to new drugs or even other kind of intervention types and have just been enamored of the field and watching what people are coming up with. The, the growth and development is just, you know, it is, it's exponential. And so it's been a really exciting place to be. And so that we're testing and designing the frameworks for testing. At the same time, we're developing the biomarkers to show success. At the same time, we're developing the therapeutics. And it's not like you sit and wait for one of these ready. It's that they all have to get ready together. Yeah. But if you don't have some ground truth that at least we have some agreement on what a finish line is, whether it's for those large scale studies, like the phase threes, that tame kind of trial like thing, but, you know, even earlier than that is we still need a lot of agreement on the early side of like, what do we call success in a mouse? What do you call success in a monkey? And if you want to make that bridge to humans, like have a way that we define success so that you can de-risk those really large phase three trials. And, and this has been a, a massive barrier. Yeah. And and Jamie, it's like, I like the analogy that we are driving the car and we are changing the tire when we are driving. That's what, that's oh, what right now. 
I think you're right. I think that's actually, it's a great privilege. Maybe it's a little less perilous. I'm thinking more like pit stops, right? Is that you're developing them all together. So you're driving, you can do a pit stop, you do a swap out, you make a change and we keep driving. It's it's an iterative, fast iterative process. And it needs to accelerate. And and, and very, very uh, exciting. And I think that uh, uh, that's uh, maybe a good uh, uh, transition to start uh, talking about uh, the X Prize, so Ashley, please. As a Longevity by Design podcast listener, you understand the value of improving your health for today and for all the years ahead. And if you want to live your healthiest, longest life possible, you need to understand what's going on inside. At Inside Tracker, we take a personalized approach to health span optimization that eliminates guesswork from your wellness plan. Inside Tracker analyzes blood biomarker and DNA data, along with physiomarker data from fitness trackers like Aura Ring to deliver personalized food, supplement, lifestyle, and exercise recommendations that allow you to take control and improve your health span. And for a limited time, Longevity by Design listeners can get 20% off at the Inside Tracker store. So if you're ready to receive a personal health analysis and data-driven wellness plan to optimize your body for the long haul, then it's time to start inside. Visit insidetracker.com slash podcast to get started today. That's insidetracker.com slash podcast to get started today. Yeah, um, Gil expressed a lot of excitement about XPRIZE existing. <laughs> so I love to bring up um, and have you explain maybe what XPRIZE is, what the mission is, and how you decided to join the company. Oh, gosh, this is a great question. So I was actually in the lab minding my own business, um, had started working on different mapping projects and looking at, at, you know, some of the molecular cellular features that underlie sort of both muscle and adipose tissue uh, decline and sort of what their functional consequences are and thinking of interventions and still designing, still waiting on TAME, still doing a lot of work. And um, I got a call and I thought the call was going to be Yes, from Peter. Okay. As I got a completely out of the blue, I got a call from Peter Diamandis, actually, and, and a couple of Peter's um, headhunters that apparently they had gotten my name from a few people. I'd had some success in the previous years, especially in 2022. I had a series of, of big awards, which was a really, really incredible nod from my fellow scientists, which I'm incredibly grateful for. The Vincent Cristofalo Award from American Federation for Aging Research. And in the same year, the Nathan Schock uh, Award from NIA. So, and had a couple of those that came through and, you know, it was great. So I was so kind of like, I got the call and I thought they were going to ask me to maybe be an advisor or to ask about it or whatever it was. Maybe they saw my name somewhere because of those. And apparently some a few folks had recommended me to them as somebody who was doing work in early translation and in geroscience. And I'd never even heard of XPRIZE. I had to Google them before we had our call. Jamie, can, I mean, I, can, can, can you please do, do us a favor to our listener and describe Peter? Yes. Because he's a driving force. He's Peter! Like, like, he's like a near Barzillai. So give us some... He's uh, a near Barzillai. That, exactly, that is a great way to think about him. He, yes. Peter is another one. He is a force of nature. Is that Peter has really dynamic personality and he is deeply deeply committed to aging and longevity the science the companies that are driving it the ideas that are out there and so yeah so peter has been completely committed to this has dedicated so much of his life to it and he is also he is as enthusiastic about this as he has so many other things <laughs> and so space, for instance, is, you know, XPRIZE began with space. So XPRIZE, and again, the name, it's not extreme, you know, XPRIZE is actually, it's solved for X, is that we know there are huge problems that we don't have solutions for. And so one way of going about finding solutions, right, a traditional academic, uh, uh, my funding structure is the research organizations or others they put big money up front people compete for it they get the money they do the research and and it goes and that's fine what peter has done is use a prize model it's to say okay here's the biggest problem we can think of instead of funding up front here is the big carrot on the stick we'll define the problem we'll set up the start line and we'll tell you what the finish line is in order to get the funds solve for x and get the prize and so i mean this is really this is the concept and so in order to get there what it does is it incentivizes 
funding and investment in these key areas because it often requires sometimes 10 times or the prize funds that you get at the end in order to really begin the process and fully design and develop and test whatever this is. And as I mentioned, XPRIZE started in space, you know, is it to actually begin to develop sort of commercialized models for space. Not you know, cheap. This is, right. Yeah. <laughs> Not cheap <laughs> and definitely ambitious. But within prize models, the goal wasn't the first person to get to the moon using commercialized, you know, space and, you know, privatized, whatever this is, some non government entity. That's not the prize. The prize was, you know, 100 kilometers two times on a manned shuttle, and it had to be done twice within two weeks so that it needs to be reusable manned space flight. And so that's not Mars. That's not the moon. That's very tangible start line, finish line, go, and that they got a winner. And not only did they get a winner, but they got a huge investment that went into the space and drew attention to it, puts a huge spotlight on it and gets people excited and thinking about it and doing it. And so this is sort of the Peter mindset is always this sort of like, okay, what's next? What's crazy? What's far enough away? But then how do you make it practical enough that somebody will start down the path? But crazy enough that when you first read it, you're like, that's insane. I'm not going to do it. No one can do it. And so there's this really kind of dynamic balance. And so Peter's just with space is where he started. And that's XPRIZE's foundation. Um, XPRIZE is now led by our CEO, Anusha Ansari. So that first space prize is actually was the Ansari X Prize. And so that money was put up first by, by Anusha and her family. She's actually one of the first Iranian-American women who was on the International Space Station. She's an absolute hero. She's a, a very, very incredible woman. And um, so she's my boss now. I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, so this is the XPRIZE culture is that, you know, it's exciting. It's fun. Yeah, we're a nonprofit foundation. We are driven entirely by either by private industry, by private groups. So these are HealthSpan, for example, has a couple of nonprofit foundations have given funding and have, uh, uh, gosh, we have 19 different sponsors for our prize alone that have contributed in some way, either as individuals, as persons who are just interested in the space, as philanthropists, that they contribute to these, you know, large scale prizes, that they know that these are the important areas, that if we don't come up with solutions fast and accelerate progress, we're never going to get there. And so again, so this is that kind of X prize model. And so now they've grown from space, they have a hundred million dollar prize urban removal, they have prizes in rainforest surveillance. They also have wildfire prizes of, you know, how do we mitigate and, and advance our response time to decrease the damage from wildfire. There are some really incredible launches. When we launched, the HealthSpan Prize was the largest prize out of X Prize, the largest one, $1 million. I hate to say it, but we have now been surpassed. On February 29th, there was a $119 million prize in water scarcity. So this is to accelerate and advance uh, water desalination at you know, and affordable. And so there are it's really incredible into efforts from there. There's also one of our most recent prize launch is a Google Quantum prize that is to accelerate and advance quantum computing. And so I just want to emphasize the breadth of work that's happening at XPRIZE is that it's not one group. It's not one idea. It's really, it is sort of what are the biggest stop gaps in humanity and how do we tackle them? And one of the biggest stop gaps is human health and aging is we're living long than any humans before us. Yeah. We have, you know, currently over over 30 years gained in expect life expectancy just in the last 100 years due to various public health measures, anything from clean water to vaccination to maternal care and on and on and better trauma care as well, right, is that the things that used to kill us no longer do. And so what we've done is we've prolonged life. We're less dead for some of those years. Is that right? Is that we haven't necessarily ch changed the fundamental biology that changes the rate at which we age. And so despite having an extension in life, is that there's a number of those years that are spent in poor quality health 
then our systems or even us as individuals are willing to really deal with. And so this has huge global consequences. Yes, it's an economic burden, but I think it's one that we all feel very personally, either ourselves or if we're caring for loved ones, is that it's a really incredible challenge and that I don't think any single group is ready or able to do it on their own. And so that's where these sort of large scale initiatives come in is what is the areas that we need the most investment that are being either, they don't have a lot of them right now, they don't have adequate attention, or they've reached some critical barrier that they have not been able to surpass on their own and need sort of a large push. And I think aging has really been in this latter category. I think people have been fascinated with immortality and long life and good life forever. I think it's innate. Yeah, but uh, uh, but again, I, I don't think that the, the X prize for health, uh, health span is... Uh, uh, for immortality is uh, not for immortality. It's you, you, really not. You you have much more. We're talking about health. This is yeah. again. This goes back to my roots. What we're doing is function, and so this is the enterprise and our health span readouts are the things that again, when we're talking to people about what's important, is that yes, aging has been important. We've talked about it, thought about it forever. I mean, fountains of youth, all of these things, they're, they're in mythology everywhere. But what means something to us is being able to live within the years that we have. And I think that's the real fear is being lonely, being disengaged, not having the ability to leave our house. And so that could be from physical disability, inability to cross a crosswalk in time, that's a major barrier for a lot of people. Yep. Having the balance and the ability to respond to external challenges so that you're not going to fall off a curb or trip on a crack and have it be devastating. To have the cognitive ability to remember when I get to the grocery store, not just to walk around the grocery store, but to remember what I'm there to get anyway. And we want to be able to engage with kids and grandkids and loved ones and others. And I think we've all learned through a national pandemic, right, is that in order to stay engaged, we need to have the resilience necessary to meet challenges. That's really, when I'm thinking about independence and the things that drive disability and drive disengagement with aging and apathy that a lot of us either feel personally or are afraid of, is that they start with these really core kernels that can be measured in humans and we think are intervenable, right? So these are, again, these core, core components, they're measurable we think they can be improved and they are have at least the right kind of measurement characteristics that we can show again, not just are we delaying some disease condition, but are we fundamentally changing how we exist in our environment? And that's that more sort of fundamental aging kind of concept. And that's just why we think about it as a health span prize. Um, again, we're not looking at how long people live. This is a one year prize. Actually, no, this is the year prize. But for our finalists to win, they're going to have to conduct one year clinical studies. So that means that they take their intervention, whatever it is, and we can talk about the different kinds that are out there and different options, but they're going to have to take whatever that therapeutic is, completely agnostic, as long as it's relatively safe. But they have to do this in humans who are already older, probably have some. Maybe they're at risk for functional decline or they're starting to already see it. They have to give that therapeutic for one year. We measure them at the beginning of the year. They'll probably have a midpoint and we measure at the end. And we look at the change over that time in those three essential functions, physical, cognitive, immune. And we need to be able to show improvement in one year in those persons who are treated relative to ones who are not. And that threshold of showing, again, not just to check that it's like maybe they're, it's a, they're attenuating the decline, we actually want to show that we're optimizing and improving health. And so, again, those are the three metrics, and it has to be one, two, and three. Yeah. So that's going to be incredibly, incredibly hard. And that if we can see that magnitude of that change is sufficient to offset declines you'd expect in 10, 15, or 20 years, that's what we're adding, putting the money to. So that's how to win. So, so Jamie, maybe uh, if we can go a bit back and if you can discuss, you said 
seven years. So what happened during the seven years? Because you said the last year is... Uh, basically ah, the, the one year. Yes, the one year. Yes. And so, again, it takes about seven years to drive this. And so we are now in a pre-launch phase. We launched on November 29th. We have an intent to compete. We're in a period called a public comment period where we're sourcing as many ideas as we can. As we put out our guests, best guess is that if we all agreed on an endpoint or what we're measuring, this we think will go. But we have to get buy-in, both from our fellow scientists, from regulatory officials, from potential investors, um, and others. Is, are these the right targets? Is this the right approach? Far, you know, we're getting refinements, but not an overhaul, which is excellent. And so there does seem to be really reasonable support for the approach that we're taking from the scientific community, from key stakeholders and others. It's great. And so what that approach is that we've set this out, we're going to have a primary registration that opens in July. That primary registration with it, we open a qualifying submissions period. This is where people turn in their ideas to us, right? As that, you know, before we can tell people that we're going to let them go in and start testing in trials, we need to show, you know, do you have sufficient data to support your therapeutic? Do you have access to it? Is it relatively safe <laughs> that maybe it's been tested in mice and they're not going to answer within 30 days? You know, <laughs> it is there. Do you have, again, sufficient evidence to show that it might work in humans and that it can be administered safely? And so there are some key questions there that this, again, goes into a qualifying submission just to show us and to show our judges that you're on the right track. We'll have a judging panel at the beginning of 2025. They'll look over those qualifying submissions and they're going to name 40 of our best competitors. They'll name them as semifinalists. Semifinalists will get a very award. It's really a token of our appreciation for their efforts <laughs> to content you of $250 per team. Those semifinalists will continue on. In fact, other teams can still join in late. That's fine. They just won't have the semifinalist distinction. But they also uh, but will need to pay. And more fee, correct? The, the fee they drive. do because we're going to have to, we use that fee to get them trained and to re empanel a judges group because we can't just sort of, you know, it's too risky for us to say just anybody who has an idea can you can go ahead and start testing people in your basement. Like we can't, we can't do that. <laughs> no, no, and, and, I'm, so... <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm, I'm saying that, uh, Jamie, it's yeah. uh, to encourage uh, uh, if anyone people would like, to register yeah, early. Yeah. And if anyone would like to compete, register early. Another point that I wanted, register early. Yeah. Another point <laughs> that uh, I wanted to uh, ask you is about uh, comments. So the comments, if uh, one of our listeners want to leave a comment, can he leave it, or it's only for yes. a specific organization or people? No, we are accepting comments from absolutely anyone. So when we say public comment, we mean public comment. So send it. Ideas. Read the competition guidelines first. We do recommend it. You can find those on xprize.org slash prizes backslash health span. So again, you could the shortened version is just xprize backslash health span. Go on there, you'll find our competition guidelines. There is also a form that you bet your comments. So do you submit comments or you can email them to us at healthspan at xprize.org. And so these are general comments from anybody. They go into a rolling document. We bring them to our scientific advisory board. Our next advisory board meeting is on March 19th. Our advisors will have, will prioritize them into different groups. And we'll say, you know, are any of these comments worthwhile to consider? Consider not. Which ones should we research more? Which are great ideas? You know, but either way, those public comments do go public is that we will have a page for them on our website that you can click to them and sort of see the different ideas that people are have that are coming in. And that, you know, that if we hear enough of these, that we'll at least can go back, consider them, not consider them, or at least, again, rebut them in some way to say, this is an excellent idea. We can't do it in our prize for this reason. But future trialists should consider this. This is a great idea. It's that it's a great opportunity for people to actually become part of the process of making the science and making the field with us. Yeah. For example, you you decided you I mean the has decided that mm -hmm. the, the endpoints are a, a muscle improvement, cognition, mm -hmm. and immune uh, improvement. So if That's someone right. thinks that cardiovascular is more important, he can uh, raise that. Please and do. Can... Please do. Trust me. When I first took <laughs> the director position, I wanted to expand our 
this much larger set that had pulmonary function, cardiovascular function. I wanted bone health in there. You know, what else did I want? Some kind of hematological measures in there. And, you know, and I had this really wide set that I was really jazzed about and doing maybe some kind of a deficit accumulation thing. And, but again, when we started kind of parsing that out, I said, okay, well, this is great, but it's not practical for this prize is that this also needs to speak to people and needs to be very understandable and as simple as possible. And so the simplest units we came out with were those three. Sure. But you're absolutely right. It doesn't mean that those other functions are not important. They're critical. And one of our goals is to at least begin to gather data on those, even if they're not used for judging. That you know There might be a better model that ends up predicting health span better than the one that we have. This is a tool to use to validate measures and to test broadly about how we test aging. And so, yeah, so there's this, you know, there's no question too silly. There's no, no comment too out there is that we're welcoming them and that they do get consideration. And those that, uh, those that we can post publicly, we will be posting publicly. Um, so again, public comment is public. Something that you said makes me think about, you know, encouraging people to help build the space together. Mm -hmm. It seems like XPRIZE is really calling for this kind of greater coordination or standardization of right. defining what aging is and creating a way to be able to compare or combine progress from all over the field. So thinking about it from that perspective, how is XPRIZE really uniquely positioned to be the people like advancing this cause or solving this problem? So that's actually one of the best reasons to have an XPRIZE like process is that it's meant to be transparent, is that rather than having a single investigative team sort of calling the shots, making the decisions, pulling things behind the scenes, you know, is that this really opens it up. And so, you know, whether that was from us, like on the TAME trial, which you need be, you have to make a lot of decisions, you get a small executive group. And I think a TAME trial did really well, especially with Nears, he really tried to open up that process. But again, but we you know we had these critical decisions to make. XPRIZE is a kind of a different model is we've intentionally opened with an intent to compete in public comment, like saying, hey, guys, this is ink. If it's terrible, please shoot it down now <laughs> and help us recreate it, you know, and that this is the process. Is it within the absence of like a, a very specific target and aim, right? This is one of the major issues for the field is we don't have this kind of standardization. Other than doing any hand waving and pretending we do acknowledge it, open it up transparent, have this as both a direction setting goal. This is where we think we're going. So it's not completely, but it's a great call for ideas is that if you are really interested in the metrics of aging, what do you think? How do we test it? What do we do? So this is not just for scientists, by the way, this is for people. Is that if, you know, what would you any taking any drug or any therapeutic or any diet, right? When I'm talking about it, starting a new exercise program or maybe starting to reduce your calories, doesn't matter what it is, they all have some level of risk. So does maintaining the status quo though. So, so either way, but when you have a certain level of risk is that it has to be outweighed in the benefits. And so we haven't had a really open way to talk to actual community members. And so if there's somebody out there, so maybe you're maybe 65, 70, 75, what level of risk are you willing to take in order to possibly better function? And that's a question we haven't really asked is that we're good about asking that in the context of disease, especially life-threatening disease. You know, if you have cancer, the, the, the answer is usually I'm willing to do whatever it takes. <laughs> um, but in the absence of that, when we're talking about prevention, or we're talking about long-term managed care. We don't really have that. We don't really have that baseline. Again, this is for scientists to tell us what matters. This is for people in the community to tell us what matters. This is for governments to tell us what matters. And so if there's anyone here who's treating patients, and you're like, what would make a difference to me when I have somebody in my clinic is X. You know, this is the time to tell us because this is when we can try to fold that into a competition that uses those as guidelines as we go. And these guidelines will hopefully feed into what could be regulatory frameworks for how people are treated and they impact back into clinical practice. How would you prescribe? How would you give? What would you do? How would you know your therapeutic is working in your population? How would you personalize it 
to the person in front of you. I mean, so these are all open questions. And, um, and so having it as an open process, it's a transparent, open plan. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, it is beautiful that uh, every person can be involved and uh, uh, basically democratize the, <laughs> the the X prize in a way that's uh, right. That, that's that's really uh, uh, really great. And if we if we can uh, go back to the process, so you said the first uh, uh, yeah. selection is the forty groups that receive a million. Then uh, that's right. Then uh, what happened after that? Okay, so let's we'll do we'll do a quicker uh, flip by all right. So right now we're in a public comment period. Next up, we have our qualifying submissions. People turn in their proposals. What are they thinking? What are they doing? Those get judged by a judging panel, completely distinct judging panel. I am not on the judging panel. <laughs> My team is not on the judging panel. So this is a purely independent group who reviews the applications and says, yes, these are our semifinalists. Others can continue to play, but these are our distinct our, uh, ones with distinction. Those teams then go on and they have to actually go in to start testing in people. And so take your idea and take it into the clinic. And what we're asked to do for that semifinal stage is that they have to show to us that show us that they're ready to go to trials or clinical studies. They have to have their regulatory paperwork in hand. They have to be able to recruit people. And this is their chance to do some proof of concept testing is what we call it. Is it pockable is one of the fancy buzz jargon words for it. Proof of conceptable. <laughs> so is it pockable? So that means, can you get somebody in and can you show me something in 30, 60, 90 days? And even if it's just 10 people that says, hey, we're on the right track. And they're going to be a biomarker-based study, something very short-term, something that you can look at and say, given this therapeutic, these are my biomarkers that show that I'm targeting what I say I'm targeting, mm -hmm. and that I might have some effects on some bump of aging that might be predictive of a study that would show cognitive function or immune. We just need to show that you're doing something, you're doing something in people, and that you can recruit people. It's almost like a run-in test for our act prize. Is can you recruit? Do you have your paperwork? Yeah. So once those semifinalists make it through that, then again, we have that independent judging panel in 2026. They have just over a year to do that work. They turn in all of their results. We'll have our judges again go back and review those semifinalists or new competitor and that paid the extra fee. Those judges review all of it. And they're going to select 10. Those 10 are our finalists. What that means is that starting in 2026, from that point on, that's when they start running those one-year clinical studies. And so it seems like, right, as soon as you start testing those, one year later, you're going to be done. But to run a trial or to run a study of anywhere from 40 to 200 people, people have to tell us, depending on their therapeutic, their design, their population, like how many do they need? That goes into their application. And then they're going to start that study. It can take three to four years on the very shortest sides. I mean, this is a really aggressive timeline for some of these studies to get run for a one-year follow-up. Yeah, and um, and then Jamie, and it's big. Ashley and myself ran a, a few years ago with a, a partner, and we were supposed yeah. to recruit 60 people, Ashley, do you remember? And we, we recruit like 20 or something like I that. I think it was 80. It was it's so really hard, hard to be able to get people. Yeah, I think 24 or something like that. We were oh, thinking, there'd be no problem to get 80, and we like were clawing for 24. I'm telling you. So that's when we show people this. They're like, oh, you're going to be done in a year. You're like, oh, no, you have no idea. Like trying to do a one-year trial and all we're giving people is three to four years. It's so hard because it can yeah. take, even if you're recruiting 100 people, it can take a year and a half easy, 18 months if you're being very mm -hmm. aggressive. Yeah. Um, so it's a challenge. Um, and so we know that, which is why we do that early proof of concept stage, right? It's like, can you first biggest barrier, can you get your regulatory documents? Can you get approval? And so there's going to be a lot of teams that that's going to throw them out, is that they're not going to be able to get those approvals and show us that they can recruit people in time to be considered as a final. Yeah. And so that's a huge barrier. And then once they're in the finals, then they just have to run it out. It takes time. So by the end of the trials, we're going to have at least 10 of those in the field collecting data. We'll have a centralized data management system and a, and a coordinating center. We're going to be, you know, sending out or hits to collect biospecimens, to do central labs, so that we anything that we use for judging, 
can be paid for that, you know? And so we're inviting partners that might have a biomarker of interest that they're trying to get validated or want test developed. It's a great opportunity for biomarker development, not just therapeutics. So for we're really encouraging anybody who has a biomarker platform or a test they want to develop or something else, please call us. This is a, I mean, right now, think about it. It's like a big blank Christmas tree. We're using the start line, the finish line, and some things we're going to use to judge success for our wording. But what this ultimately becomes is one of the greatest scientific resources that we've had to date. In order to develop, whether it's a biomarker, a test, anything else, is you need populations. You need not just one therapeutic, but many. You need to test it in different populations to see how robust it is. You need long-term longitudinal follow-up, which we'll get this within over a year. And you'll be able to test it across these different trial types. And so this is like, it is such a great resource. Again, it's like this big blank Christmas tree that we're inviting people to come up and hang your scientific ornaments on. And so this is, it's, it's just a, it's one of the many reasons that I came over to do this is that these are the same things we were trying to do from the academic side, but here we have a greater visibility, a bigger platform and more transparency in how the process runs. So again, it's a great opportunity for anybody around the process. Then, and that has nothing to do with our awarding, but it has everything to do with science and next stage discovery about how do we personalize these approaches what really works, what's happening to the biology underneath. In addition to that cognitive, physical, and immune function, what's the whole changes at the molecular and cellular level that we might be seeing? And who can, you know, apply to compete, so to speak? Is it going to be companies, groups of random people, like <laughs> yes. labs at universities? <laughs> All of the above. And so, you know, right now, really active space since we launched in um on november 29th uh, we have been active now just over two months we have over 200 teams that have at least wow. signaled their intent to compete um, out of those over 200 teams they are i mean their therapeutic types are just about anything is that we're seeing new drugs, we're seeing repurposed drugs, we're seeing nutraceuticals, we're seeing supplements, we're seeing a few June therapies, we're seeing a few stem cell therapies, we're seeing other biologics and vaccines. We're seeing lifestyle interventions, either on their own or in combination with any of those others. We're even seeing some devices. So whether this is things like an inside tracker, right, where you're able to maybe better personalize what that approach is, and that can be either alone or in combination with one of these others, is that we're just inviting people to unlock how we do this. We don't care what it is as long as it is safe yeah. and it can be done and it has a magnitude of effect. And so the teams that are coming in from these, you know, by and large, the earliest people signaling their intent to compete are primarily from a commercial space. A lot of them are sort of early stage startups. We do have some bigger companies that are signaling their interest. We'll see if they come in. And then our other healthiest group that, again, it's it's a really great dynamic group, are universities and nonprofits and research institutes. They are strongly interested. They tend to come in a little bit later, not just on health span, but on other prizes. Is that there's usually a little more red tape for them to figure out before before they can signal their willingness or ability to compete. And so, you know, for each of these, these are going to be doing up to clinical. And so individuals can come in and we will have an engaged partner network and ecosystem so that hopefully individuals can meet teams. Because again, you've got to be able to recruit participants. You have to be either partnered with a clinic or a lab or somebody that will hopefully have the infrastructure to allow you to do that. But we have a whole process and a whole group that, you know, one of the goals, one of the things that makes an X prize an X prize is we can be behind the scenes developing an ecosystem, a global collaborative network that we can do a little bit of matchmaking and try to help people find the resources that they're lacking, whether that's funding and investment or clinical trial sites or somebody who's better at drug development if you need it. So again, we're only going to be as good as those who sign up to play. So we encourage everybody to get involved either as a team or within our ecosystem. And Jamie, question about the process of the trial. So normal trials today is a control versus treatment. Yeah. I'm asking whether it can be, for, for example, the study that me and uh, uh, Ashley ran was actually crossover. So we, we treat, we had a washout and then uh, we had a, a placebo or whatever. 
And it was also double blind. That's okay to do or it's so not okay? That's going to be a challenge. We've gone back and forth on this one is that we want to leave open the opportunity for alternative trial designs. So I have run crossover trials. And I think they're fantastic. These ones will be challenging just because of the one year period. And so it, we're not telling people what they can or can't do. They're just saying that it has to make sense. And you have to be able to show that, you know, one year, one year running a crossover for one year could often mean either that your control group is tested for either six months or not test, you know, your control group is controlled for at least six months of that, even yeah. if they're not a full year or however that works, people just have to make their design make sense. Yeah. And so whether it's a crossover or whether it's a personalized sort of adaptive approach, right, where you're testing, you're administering, you're testing, you're refining what's being given, there's all different ways people could do this. It's not the traditional double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial. Right. What, what about um, uh, L I love, I love a factorial trial. So for folks that are doing combinations, a factorial trial means, right, that you might be testing, maybe I have my biologic that I'm testing. And then I also have, let's just say, for example, I have a digital platform that tracks my health that can be used to make decisions. And maybe that's my baseline condition is what happens when I just have the app. And then what happens when I add a therapeutic to that app? What happens when I add drug you know, excuse me, my therapeutic plus a diet on top of that app, you know? And so it's, and so if you're doing those, there are great ways that you can do factorial design trials to see the effects either of them over in combination that may or may not have, like your control group might not be a placebo. Your control group might be a different kind of yeah. control. It just depends on what you're testing and what you're proposing as your therapeutic. So, so you are pretty Pretty open to a trial design. The only limitation, it should be happening in a unit of a year, correct? Year to the one year. That's yeah. right. <laughs> what, what about a, a other method like Mendelian randomization, for example? So take observational study and use Mendelian randomization to uh, to to separate between control and uh, treatment. So one of the great things, right, is that we are trying to run this as flexibly as possible. Okay. Is that there's a whole lot that needs to be innovated <laughs> in thinking about how to test in aging. And one part of it, again, we're really focusing on the therapeutic, but behind the scenes, the other things that we really need innovation is in trial design, what we call success, biomarkers, and everything in between. They all need to be developed together. And so, you know, so that's... That's why we're not, we don't mean to be cagey about it. doesn't need to have a placebo randomized trial. Yeah. It just means like, bring us your thoughts and we'll have a judging panel that we're coaching, that we'll be coaching to be as flexible as possible, as long as they make the endpoints make sense. And that we feel that we can judge that this is improved or not improved relative to some referent control group, whatever that might be for you. It doesn't have to be placebo. And how you're recruiting people into it just needs to be justified. And so, again, so that we're leaving it intentionally flexible to allow people to innovate. And and the, let, let's talk for a second on the of, on the end point of the end point. So uh, basically, here finished. What uh, should mm -hmm. this entity prove that uh, happened in order to receive the prize? Right. In order to see the prize, we will be providing thresholds. And so, one thing that we found when we were first designing and talking about this prize is there was the idea is that it would be an age reversal thing, right? So that you show that your 70 year old now has the function of a 50 year old. You can't do that. <laughs> and mathematically speaking, what happens if you actually look at the population level is that your cells, if you're looking at say the extensor strength, the D extensor strength of a 70 year old yeah, it might be a little lower than a 50-year-old, but really what happens with aging is it becomes more variable. And so what you end up having are two population distributions that overlap. And so you don't get the kind of separation that you would need to in order to develop thresholding to say yes, improved, no, didn't improve, and by how much. And so the simplest way that we're going about this, what, what is, however, more linear in terms of change is the longitudinal that annualized longitudinal rate of change. And so that does have a quasi-linear relationship for some of these measures and tests. And so when we're developing these tests and we'll be putting out a protocol book that people have to follow, we're gonna tell you what tests they are. We're gonna provide ample training and opportunity to learn sort of how we're proposing to do this. 
And we'll also be setting out sort of referent group thresholds of saying this magnitude of change you need to show in order to get this amount of money. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be a best team too. So, you know, so we have those, it's the expected change you would see in 20 years, 15 or 10. And so, and we give more award for the biggest effect. Okay. That's uh, that's great, uh, Jamie. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we go to the uh, end of this interview. It was uh, really fascinating. Uh, and, uh, I know a lot about this domain and I learned a lot. So uh, <laughs> it was amazing. And uh, we are uh, used to finish the uh, um, the interview with uh, a question. And uh, Ashley, please uh, ask the question. Sure. So every podcast we end with the same thing of if you have a top tip that you would be willing to share with listeners about how they can improve their health. Is there something that you strongly believe in or do yourself? And it can be boring. Most of them are. Uh, yeah, I was going to say right now, until we have some really incredible validated <laughs> and, you know, tools, follow your grandmother's advice. <laughs> Do the boring, great things you already know you're supposed to be doing. Diet, exercise, yeah. and get, get people that you love. Have fun. Oh, my God. This is it, guys. We're alive, <laughs> and it's incredible supposed to be a blast enjoy it i think don't think we take quite enough time to just really appreciate that living is a gift and that really you know that's one way to maximize the time we have is to not miss the moments awesome excellent Th thank you so much uh, jamie it was a real pleasure to to learn about uh, uh the x prize and uh, uh we wish you good luck and I would Thank love you. to, uh, if it's okay with you, to invite you uh, 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 during the stages and uh, interview you and uh, see, uh, show a progress report for our listener. Oh my gosh, we would love that so much. So I myself would enjoy it. I had a really good time here. You guys had really informed questions and I appreciate the thoughtfulness. Would love to come back and talk about the different stages of the award. And also, you know, certainly our teams. As we advance, I think there would be some really exciting teams and developments that, again, if we get some really either crazy fun ideas or people that you should have on. Absolutely. Um, we, we love crazy ideas. The only <laughs> so, <laughs> so do we. So do we. So, yeah. So, again, I think that would be really, really great. And I know that our teams and our ecosystem would really appreciate it. So anybody that's in our network, there's a lot of great, great people. Excellent. So again, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, I will talk again uh, soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.